Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 3. The last gospel message to an ungodly world. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And they said, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and pestilences, I mean diseases, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That means that's a season referred to in the scripture when the world itself goes into, in a sense, birth pangs, preparing for the coming of Christ. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. You know, we ask ourselves the question this morning. What will be the final sermon that will be preached in this world? Because Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Now I know and you know that the gospel has been preached throughout most of the world in our time. But I feel that this verse is telling us that in the last days there will be a gospel that will be preached. It will be an in irrefutable evidence of the reality of God in Christ Jesus. The truth of the cross, the truth of the resurrection, the truth of the indwelling and sustaining power of God, it will be preached as a witness to all nations before the end comes. Now Jesus tells us that in the last days there will be a deception will be abounding. As the world begins to spin out of control and people try to find a safe refuge. There will be many who are looking for a refuge in God, only to find that they have to get through this gauntlet of false prophets who have been sent to confuse the way to eternal life. Actually, it's a good military strategy of the enemy himself to create chaos and then create confusion so the people have a hard time to find their way through to safety. He says in verse 5, many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, it's not too hard to spot a false Messiah who says, I am Christ. Now, I think what he's really referring to, those will come without doubt, but what he's referring to is that there will be ministers and ministries that are raised up, and they will be saying to the people, this is what Christ looks like. And much of this, Jesus said, will be a deception. It will not be the way to everlasting life. There will be no power in it. There will be no keeping strength in it. It will be a deceptive gospel that leaves people in the last moments of time, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, without oil. They have no life. They have no power. They have no vision. They can't see Christ in the day of calamity. When darkness comes, that midnight hour, there will be a people who have no oil. They've not cultivated a right relationship with God. They've never understood what is the life source. What is the power source of the gospel? How does the gospel manifest itself? How do I have vision in these last days? How can I see God when nobody else seems to be able to see him around me? You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. All these things must happen, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against ki kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. Wars and famines. And we're living at a time, folks, and you know it as well as I do, this could happen today. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations. For my name's sake. There will be a, a hatred in this world 
for what God loves and says is good. And there'll begin to be an affliction given the people who walk in agreement with God. In other words, we're going to be living at a time when there is a, a, an absolute lawlessness will break out in the world. Paul said conclusively to the Corinthian church that it's, it's virtually an unspeakable lawlessness that's going to break out. Something such as we've never seen through all time in all history. A rebellion against God that's, that's going to reach astronomical proportions. Men will be selfish and covetous and lovers of themselves. We'll see an absolute breakdown of family love. There, there will be just, it will shock people who are not ready for it. This, this culmination of, of what began in the Garden of Eden when Satan sowed that seed of rebellion in humankind that man in himself can be his own God. And this, this iniquity, this mystery of lawlessness is at work. And one day, Thessalonians tells us the restraining hand of God will be taken away and it will just pour forth like a baptism of evil over the whole earth. And it will culminate with a Satan indwelt man who will be raised up and he will go to the temple in Jerusalem. He will sit down in the temple and he will declare himself to be God. An, a man declaring self, himself to be God. It will, absolute, it will be the, the, the epitome, it will be the climax of human rebellion. And the tragedy is most of the world would probably agree with him. Jesus said, I've come in my name, but you reject me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. It's hard to, hard to believe that humanity left to itself will get to the point of looking at just a, a, a demonically inspired flesh and blood man and actually believe. Paul said to the Thessalonians church, don't let any man deceive you by any means. That day will not come except to come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God and showing himself that he is God. The final act of rebellion in this world. Verse 11 tells us again that there's a myriad of confusing voices that will be pointing to where they say both spiritual and physical safety can be found. Many false prophets will rise and shall deceive many. And so it's imperative, my friends, that we look into these verses of Scripture and say, what, what is the antidote? What are the boundaries? What has to be inside of me that I'll not be deceived in these last days? I don't want to be among the many who go into deception. Jesus starts by saying, take heed that no man deceive you. He warns about those who are coming in the name of Christ and taking many off the path that leads to true life and safety. And then again in verse 11, he talks about many false prophets rising and deceiving many. It's a sad thing, actually, when you think of it, that their followers will be many. Let me tell you why this happens. I'm just going to read it to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. For the mystery of iniquity already is at work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. There's, there's something holding back this lawlessness until he be taken out of the way. Now many believe this is an event called the taking away of the church of Jesus Christ. When, when Christ comes to take his church out of this world. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perished, here's why they perished. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the, here's the issue. It doesn't say in the scripture they didn't know truth. It doesn't say they didn't study truth. Remember Paul said in 2 Timothy, there, the last days will be characterized by a people in the house of God who are always learning, but not coming 
to the place where that truth is supposed to bring them. Now, it doesn't say they didn't receive the truth. It doesn't say they didn't say it was the truth. It doesn't say they didn't acknowledge that it was the truth. It just simply says they didn't receive the love of the truth. It's not that they didn't know it, but there's a certain love contained within the truth that they refuse to embrace. It's the love of the truth. May, may I say it this way? Knowing the truth brings you and I to a place, a certain place of love. We love the truth, but then the truth produces some kind of a supernatural love within our hearts, and they neglected to embrace that, and that is the very root of the last day's deception. Verse 12 tells us, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now there'll be an obvious loss of love in society. We're, we're living there now. I mean, people don't love truth. There'll be a loss of love in society. Love, natural love actually is what it means. It will break down. There, there'll be a, an increase in lawlessness and selfishness. But this verse applies also to you and I. Because it will become increasingly difficult to love people. As God does. As the days grow darker and human rebellion against truth moves towards its finished. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. Iniquity. It will become difficult to love people. As God does. Become difficult not to join the critics and the finger pointers and the angry in our midst. It would be difficult to represent the Christ who went to a cross enduring the scorn of a generation that spit in his face and pulled out his beard and whipped his back simply because he came to redeem them from their own rebellion towards a holy God. It will become difficult. As a matter of fact, it will be impossible without the love of God within us. Remember, they received not the love of the truth. Oh yes, they received the truth, but not the love of it. They would not embrace it. In verse 13 says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now folks, we know we're not saved through endurance. I mean, if, if you just read that straight out, you'd think, uh, well, I'm just going to be doggedly determined. I'm going to make it to the... We're not finished. We're not saved through endurance. Thank God we're saved by faith in a finished work on Calvary. And we're kept by the promises of, of God in Christ. I know that it's... I know that it's not endurance that saves me. So then what is Jesus talking about in this verse? Well, here's how I read this verse. It's in this context. The saved... The truly saved will be given the power to endure till the end. We will be given the power to endure. Like Daniel in the lion's den. Like the three Hebrew boys in the furnace. No matter what society throws our way. No matter what kind of scorn or derision is laid at your doorstep because you choose to love and you choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You choose to be honest. You choose to tell the truth. You choose to stay with your family when nobody else around is doing it. You make the right choices. Given the power to endure by Almighty God. Have you seen what they're doing? Have you seen how they're breaking down everything I hold dear? Have you seen how they're destroying the very fabric of our society? Have you heard their rants and their ravings? And the Lord will say to you and to me, Oh yes, I have. Oh yes, I have. You forget that one day I was on a cross. One day they were walking by me, wagging their heads saying, He says he's the Son of God. Let his Father have him if he will save him, if he will have him. Oh, he saved him. others himself he cannot save. Come down from the cross and we will believe you. And think about it for a moment. When he spoke these incredible words and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What were they doing at the moment? Look down at the foot of the cross and the scripture tells us they were gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross. It's an incredible example of divine love and human depravity. The Son of God is on that cross. He is offering covering. He is offering redemption. He's offering forgiveness. He's offering restoration. He's offering futures. He's offering an eternity with God. And here they are at the foot where the blood is dripping down into the soil and they are literally gambling for his clothing. Like scavengers at a cross. 
gambling for what they can get out of this sacred moment and not what they can give. They're, they're blinded to the whole situation. God is giving his life. He's giving his all. He's giving the very blood in his body. He's willing to endure the separation from his father, which to our minds is not understandable. When he said, Father, I don't want to go through this, take this cup, he wasn't necessarily talking just about the cross. It was the separation from his father that had never been known ever at any time. Almost unthinkable. One day you and I are going to get to heaven and we're going to see what that cost the Son of God. And at the foot of the cross, with all this being offered, what are they doing? They're picking apart his earthly goods. Talk about spiritual blindness. It's almost a type of what goes on even in the name of God. We have this incredible sacrifice of love that is given for all of humanity. And we have many who claim to belong to Christ at the foot of the cross, literally gambling for earthly things. No wonder they have no vision. No wonder there's no sight. No wonder they will be deluded and deceived. When some voice rises up and says, this is Christ, this is what he looks like, because they've rejected the real Christ. Rejected the love of God. Rejected that which God calls them into and caused them to follow in. No, the fuel source of life is love. Divine love, supernatural love. There's nothing in you and nothing in me that can produce this. It has to be supernatural. It has to be given to me. I've not had anybody slap my face yet. I've not had anybody pull my hair out. I've not had anybody beat my back. Now Paul did. And Paul had that love in him. He said even among those that were causing him pain, he said, I, I wished that I myself could be accursed for my brethren's sake. That's the love of God. That's what Jesus was made a curse, that we might be set free from the curse of sin. And Paul had that in his heart and said, I wish that I could become a curse, that they might be set free from the curse of sin that is heading them to an eternal hell. That's the love of God. That's what propelled this man. That's why he didn't give up. That's why he never became jaded. That's why he never lost heart. That's why I believe the Roman soldiers chained to him in that last prison cell loved him. They saw something that this world can't produce. And by God's grace, I've got to get there. And you've got to get there because it's our strength for the last days. This gospel, Jesus said, of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, then shall the end come. In a season where the whole world is turning against the things of God, where everything is going into lawlessness and rebellion, here's the last message. There will be a people filled with the love of God. There will be a people who stand before their generation, whether it's in your workplace, your apartment, in your own home, among your own family, wherever it is that God would have you. You're, this, there's going to be a people who stand and their hearts are filled with the love of God. They will not be deceived. They will not be led to another Christ. They will not be looking for safety for themselves anywhere else but in the love of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ had every opportunity to be bitter. Can you imagine? He created humanity. And here they are, mocking him, spitting on him, gambling for his clothing. And all he is doing is speaking life. He's giving his mother into the care of his beloved friend John. He's just simply, all his words are just life and even asking for forgiveness. And he's even forgiving and taking a thief with him into paradise. He had every opportunity to become bitter, but by the strength of of the Holy Spirit within him he endured. That's what I believe that this verse in Matthew speaks about. He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Or he that has the power to endure to the end is saved is a better probable way to say that. The power to endure in love. The power to be given for people. This is the work of God, my friends. You and I, will be the last gospel preached to an ungodly world. We will be. We are. 
the last gospel message, this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of endurance, this gospel that doesn't quit, this gospel that is given to people even when they are absolutely steeped in rebellion to a holy God. This gospel will be preached in all the world. That means it will be preached through you and through me. In the streets, in the subways, in the office, in the apartment, wherever it is that you are. This gospel will be preached in all the world. There's a day coming when it's going to be very difficult. There's a day coming of crisis when things begin to spin completely out of control. When it's going to be very hard. And that's where we will see the next chapter in Matthew fulfilled. When there's a cry in those who know Christ saying, he's coming. Can't you see? Don't you understand? Don't you know? And there will be others who have sat in the presence of God, but they have rejected this love of the truth. The truth has not brought their hearts into unison with God. It's never produced, oh, they've loved life, they've loved garments, they've loved church, they've loved their own families, and they've loved those who love them. But it's never brought them into a crucified love, into that kind of love that only God can give. Now, I'm in the same boat that you're in right now. I've just preached myself under tremendous conviction because I can't do this, and neither can you. I'm kind of thankful I can't do it and I'm thankful that you can't do it it puts us all on level footing we all stand before the throne of God say Lord Jesus you got to come now and you got to fill me up and you've got to help me to love the unlovely I can't do it in my own strength and Lord you have to do it now 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 is when you and I have to get the oil now is when we need the strength I, I find the Lord doing that in my heart more and more all the time. Taking me out of where I shouldn't be and bringing me into where I should be. But it's a fight, folks. There's everything in the human heart doesn't want to go there. We want everything of God. We want the history. We want the garments. We want the moment. We want to sing the songs. We want everything but the work of God, which is the winning of the lost. But most often it's somebody that's stabbing you in the back in the worst in the workplace. Cursing your God. Calling you an idiot. The fool because of what you believe. Most often that's the case and that's the love that the truth will bring us into. And again I want to st state this point. They did not receive the love of the truth. The love that truth brings into the heart. They didn't receive it. That's why they were given to delusion. I want with all my heart to be given for people. And I know you do as well. We must find the strength now. Some of these people will never respond to your gestures of kindness. Some of them did not respond to Christ. They heard all his words and they're in hell today. They were there at the cross, but they rejected it. But that doesn't mean we stop because it's not received. We let God manifest this love through us. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord. I know that I have delivered your heart. And I know, Lord, this is going to keep us in the coming days. You have to help us in this because none of us can do this. Without your spirit upon us, it just becomes a pie in the sky principle that we can't attain to. You have to come and do it within us. You have to come and give us the love. And I thank you, Lord, that you've been giving me victory. I praise you, God, for it with all my heart. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that those who labor must be the first partaker of the fruits. And you led me through some very deep water where I had to learn to love something that I hate. And God, I thank you for giving me the victory. I thank you with all my heart 
I praise you that I feel in my heart that I'm clear and clean of offense to God and man. Oh, Jesus, I pray for this church. Lord, we're going to have to be baptized. It says on our marquee, the church that love is building. I didn't put that there. That was there when I got here. But you must have declared that over this church. You must have spoken it prophetically over Times Square Church. Because it is the church that love is building and has to build. And Father, I pray that, that what's written on our sign not be a fraud in this generation. It be really true that we be a people who do know the love of God, who are ambassadors of the love of God, who are supernaturally enabled by the love of God. And the truth has brought us to this love of God, that we're able to go to all people everywhere, no matter what happens to us, and be absent of all fear because love casts out fear. Jesus, help us to love this generation. God, help us to love those who are blaspheming your name. Help us, Lord, to be your body, to be this last gospel message to an ungodly world. And Father, I thank you for this, Lord. Now, only you, Holy Spirit, can make this a reality. I can't do it, and my best efforts can't do it. Only you can do it. But you said in your word that if a son asks for bread, you'll not give him a stone. And you said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so today, Lord, we're asking you, Jesus, to fill us. God, fill us with your love. Beginning where we need it the most. And Jesus, we know that this will keep us from deception. It will keep us from fear. It will keep us, Lord, in the coming days. And it will keep us a living testimony of Christ. Father, I thank you for this in your precious name.